The Edge Runners mission kit is out, and with it, we have a new collection of official biographies and life stories pertaining to the show's most important characters. And in knowing more about the stories that shaped who they are, that can really change how we see them and how we see their roles in the show. So, let us take a look. I will also be cross-referencing my own analyses that I have made on each of these characters with this new information to see if any of my predictions or assumptions about their pasts have been accurate or if there's anything that I would personally change about what I did. I am particularly interested in Kiwi's backstory as Kiwi has quickly become my favorite character from the show in place of Maine. But without further ado, let us take a closer look at each of these characters by starting with our protagonist, David Martinez. David Martinez was born in the back of an ambulance, but not in the way that you're thinking. His mother, Gloria, was actually in the middle of stitching up an edge runner whose arm had been shot off when her water broke. Once Gloria had saved this mercenary, she waved him off the stretcher, took his place, and into the world, we David Martinez came. His umbilical cord was actually cut by the mantis blade of the mercenary whose arm his mom had just sewn back on. From that point onward, Gloria was determined to ensure that the brutality of David's birth, right down to the killing blade that sliced his umbilical cord, was kept as far away from him as possible. Which, as we see, was not enough. Gloria was financially constrained, and David had to grow up in Santo Domingo, one of the poorest regions in Night City. David grew up surrounded by gangsters, cyber psychos, and addicts. And to top it all off, David was far too unruly and daring to oblige his mother's desire for him to follow a more bloodless path. David developed a hero complex from a young age, viewing himself as special and almost invincible to a degree, but this did not mix well with his desire to never let his mother down. David was apparently the kid who would badger any edge runner he met in his mega building with endless questions, and he would always hang around the Ripper docks to see what new chrome they just got in. This is likely how David first met Doc. David's curiosity often got him into fights. At one point in David's childhood, a gangster broke his hand off of David's face when he was trying to beat him. Although the result was the gangster leaving crying and David leaving laughing with blood running down his face. As David grew older, he only grew bolder because of incidents like this. His ability to scare off gangsters in Santo Domingo his ability to chat up every edge runner he met, and his friendship of sorts with Doc would fan the earliest flames of his belief that he was, in fact, special. I would say everything here isn't super unexpected. You can see in the earliest episodes of Edge Runners that David is spunky and he does tend to get into trouble just based on his own decisions. I also love the parallel of the cords of his life being cut by the cold, steely brutality of Night City. Both that first cord when he was born and the cord that held him to life in his final moments. David lived by the rules of Night City and he died by the rules of Night City. David was doomed from the start as much as his mother sought to prevent it. But I will say, from this backstory, I am very happy to have seen more of Gloria. These new references to her make me view Gloria in a more positive light. In my analysis on Gloria that I released a few months ago, I posit the idea that Gloria very well could have been somewhat like a scav. And while yes, it is totally possible that Gloria did in fact fall very far from the dedicated nurse that she was in order to provide for her son, seeing this disciplined woman set aside her own labor pains to sew the arm onto this guy says a lot about the kind of person she is. Perhaps this is just a hint towards how selfless she is and self-sacrificing she is, hinting towards the lengths that she may have been willing to go for her son. But this could also 
also be viewed as Gloria having very deep set principles of just wanting to help people as well. So who knows, I could very well be wrong with my scav insinuation. With this backstory, you can better see why David and his mom sort of circle each other with their own ideas of what they want for each other or for themselves. How both of these people don't really understand what the other wants, largely due to how stubborn and determined they both are to get what they want. It's just quite tragic how similar these two are, but that is, I think, one of the reasons why they had trouble meeting in the middle. Next up, we have Lucy. Lucy Kushinada was born to a Japanese father and a Polish mother, and she grew up in an Arasaka-supported neighborhood in Warsaw. Lucy's father was a veteran of the Fourth Corpo War, while her mother was actually a Polish netrunner who was involved in a very, very well-known gang of highly skilled netrunners. But Lucy's mother left when she met Lucy's father because they were genuinely in love. Lucy's earliest years were very idyllic. She grew up in comfort and wealth, and she loved her parents very dearly. This background to me, total side note, just explains why Lucy's outfit in Edge Runners is very neo-militaristic, which is a style used primarily by corpos. She's got a bit of kitchen there just to show some of the street kid influences she has, but again, her past is dominated by her corpo origins. But Lucy, who was a skilled hacker from a young age, had a curiosity that was almost as insatiable as David Martinez's. One day, a young Lucy decided to hack her father's computer, and on that computer, she found out about the atrocities that her father committed during the Fourth Corpo War. On one hand, Lucy was disturbed by the fact that these atrocities were considered achievements by her father. But on the other hand, the revelation that Lucy's father was not the man she thought he was, was a shattering revelation for her. She grew scared of a man that she had grown up adoring, believing that her father protected and loved her and that he was a good man. Lucy struggled to deal with this discovery, and she rebelled in the limited ways that she could. Lucy would run away from home, though given Arasaka resources, she would always be found and brought back. She would also delve into the net on a regular basis, a digital world of escape, and was considered something of a prodigy. But her father, ever loyal to Arasaka and frustrated with his daughter's escape attempts, forced Lucy to take the corpse net running aptitude test which led to Lucy becoming a netrunner for the Arasaka Corps. And keep in mind that Lucy was just a child. Lucy's story from here is pretty much as she says it was. She and a bunch of other kids were forced to scour the old net for Arasaka, for old data and information and whatever else Arasaka could find. Lucy watched as the kids that she worked with died all around her, one after the other, killed by the dangerous wilderness of the old net. Lucy and some of the remaining survivors of her group made a final escape attempt, where only she escaped with her life. Lucy decided against heading home, and it's completely understandable. Her father sold her out, and we don't read anything about her mother trying to resist this. Lucy had never been able to recover from what she knew of her father, and now, with this added bit of trauma, she was rightfully terrified. Lucy genuinely did not know if her father would turn her back in, even after telling him that all the other children had been killed and that she had narrowly avoided bullets herself. Lucy ran across Europe for years, never stopping for very long in any one place. Lucy could feel her mother trying to pursue her through the net, and so Lucy just kept running all the way to Night City. But by this point, Lucy had convinced herself that she would never feel comfy so long as she was on Earth. Lucy's dream then became to escape to the moon, where she felt that would be the only place her parents could not find her, which is a pipe dream on its own, unfortunately. But Lucy was just so desperate to get away. Running was what she was good at. And the dream that there was somewhere else, so astronomically remote, that she could flee to was what she needed to keep her going. But when Lucy met Kiwi, presumably after crossing paths on the net, she laid down some roots for the first time. 
Lucy's backstory explains why she is so antsy. It explains why stamina is so important to her, as someone who has constantly been running for so long. Lucy doesn't want to rely on others. Even her preferred use of building her stamina through jogging says a lot about how self-reliant she is. Lucy's got severe trust issues, which is why I think she latches on to David so strongly. If I could go back and redo my Lucy video, I think that I would definitely change some things concerning her theme of running away. Lucy has spent years running, and the one time that she decides to not run and to try and stay and help David without telling him is when everything sort of implodes. It's not her fault, but it's just... It's poetic. Some might say that Lucy is a rich kid who made her own problems and had a really privileged position in life, but I think she was also a kid who grew up with this very sparkly illusion of life and the people she thought she knew, only to have that all just crumble away. Her parents were people who she thought loved her and cared for her and were genuinely good people. She trusted them and that trust was destroyed. Finding out your parents lied or omitted certain truths from you as a child never ends well. It tends to backfire most of the time. Don't lie to your kids. I also think Lucy's story and what we know about her makes Kiwi's lesson to her of never trust anybody in Night City a whole new level of devastating. It's what makes Lucy's desperation to cling on to David so sad because Lucy genuinely just wants to trust someone again, but she doesn't know how. I think this is one reason why she doesn't tell David what she believes is Arasaka trying to hunt him down. And she wants to trust David so badly because he genuinely wants to protect her, and he is a pure person to her. She trusts in who he is, but she can't trust him. If I could remake my Lucy video again, I would absolutely address Lucy's inability to trust a lot more than I did in that video. Next bio is for Maine. Maine was born in the state of Maine. Big surprise. He was raised by a single mom who had started with dreams of becoming a jazz singer. However, this never quite worked out for her, and she supported her son by working long hours as a waitress. As a kid, Maine was scrawny and sickly, and he often got picked on by the other kids at school. As Maine took these beatings, he promised himself that someday he would be bigger and stronger than all of the kids who bullied him. When Maine was a teenager, he started boxing. He was able to make some cash in the underground fight scene. This is how his journey to being just shy of a chrome dome began. Maine focused on getting bigger and stronger and becoming a more competent fighter, to the point that he could take people out in one hit. Every fight got him more earnings that he reinvested into his body. Maine's mother died when he was relatively young, and after this point, Maine would take jobs as a bouncer. However, Maine never stayed at one club or bar for too long, as he had a rough time letting people off easy. His biggest fight was actually against some NUSA Spec Ops soldiers, who he took out with surprising ease. So surprising, in fact, that this led to a job offer to join the Spec Ops squad. Maine wasn't just a soldier, he was considered a cut above. To Maine, before he really got into the thick of what this job meant, this was a really cool opportunity. Another cool thing about Maine's past is that he served in the same unit as Solomon Reed, this familiar fellow in Phantom Liberty. But Maine's experience in the military quickly soured. As much as Maine enjoyed combat, he could not handle blatant injustice. He watched as villages in South America were razed to the ground, for no real reason other than corporate greed. After two years, Maine was done. Reed actually invited Maine to join the network of spies that he was setting up in Night City, as we can see the results of in Phantom Liberty, but Maine was done with whatever the NUSA was cooking. But still to Night City, Maine would go, this time to start his own mercenary crew, backed with all that military chrome that he had gotten from his years of service. After reading this backstory, I have even more complicated feelings on Maine. He is very, very much a mirror for David, and he's more so one after this. 
I would still approach my analysis of him in a different light, however, acknowledging the fact that Maine has some serious psychological scars. I can't help but wonder if this contributed to his eventual cyberpsychosis, given the humanity stat that is used in the tabletop game for cyberpunk. A key factor of which being how you come out of stressful and traumatic situations. And the reason why I think that is because we can see that Maine is, at heart, a more gentle person than most. As much as he loves fighting, this is what separates Maine's crew from most. This is why Maine feels genuinely bad when Gloria dies. This is one reason why he will put himself on the line for David or for Becca, along with his own complex of being special. We get to see firsthand in Phantom Liberty the level of ruthlessness of the NUSA, and that's just through covert operations. I can only imagine how it would have felt to have been a part, or at the very least witnessed, fellow soldiers burning down villages where the people who were there, odds are, didn't want anything to do with this conflict. They would have just wanted to live their lives, as it so often tends to go in times of conflict and war. The fact that Maine's life ends as violently as it does, massacring first responders, who were kind of just there to do their job, I think would have been something that Maine, in his right mind, would have been horrified at himself for. But at the same time, I can't help but view Maine as a bit of a hypocrite. He clearly abhorred the violence of the NUSA, specifically against innocents. But as an edgerunner in Night City, there is no way you aren't causing some degree of harm to some innocent people. Something has to give eventually. As it did for David when, in a fit of cyberpsychosis, he killed that mother of that young boy. Maine and David are so similar. For Dorio, her backstory is very interesting because, first of all, she's Icelandic, which I wouldn't have thought. I just, it never crossed my mind. Both of her parents were gym rats and athletes who actually traveled the world as professionals. Dorio was more or less raised to follow in their footsteps, having their dream sort of impressed upon her. And this is where Dorio's imposing physique and her dedication to maintaining it comes from. She and her parents traveled the world for countless meets and competitions until they came to settle in Night City. Dorio's mother was not a fan of stopping in Night City, but her father saw a lot of promise in fighting in the underground rings ran by the animals. And it worked well enough that eventually Dorio and her family were able to live comfortably. Dorio's father actually joined the gang as much as her mother did not like it. But her father insisted that he could maintain this lifestyle they were living, and continue he did until the voodoo boys arrived one day and killed him along with a bunch of other animals. Dorio and her mother turned to each other in this time of grief. They were able to live comfortably with one another as support, and both would turn to athleticism and being in the gym as a way to cope. It was their family activity that mother and daughter did together. But as Dorio grew older, she realized that her mother's dream of being a professional athlete was not one that she shared. Dorio actually didn't really know what she wanted, and she kind of floated. The only thing that Dorio was sure of was her hatred for both the animals as well as the voodoo boys. Blaming one gang for getting her father into a situation that would kill him, and blaming the other for being that gang that killed him. To young Dorio, these two gangs were responsible for the fracturing of her family, even though it was her father's final decision. Which would be a really hard thing to accept, especially when you're still grieving. I don't think you'd ever fully recover from something like what happened to her family. After buying her first gun, Dorio decided that what her dream or purpose was, was to kill animals and voodoo boys and any gangsters like that. Or at least that was what she told herself. When Dorio finally cornered her first intended victim, she actually hesitated when she held the gun to his head. Because Dorio is not given to stone-cold, execution-style killing, and I love that we get to see that here. But before her target could take advantage of her hesitation, she was saved by none other than Maine. Maine had actually been following her as she had followed this gangster. 
and he immediately offered her a spot in his gang. Maybe it was Dorio's impressive strength and agility, despite her imposing size. Maybe it was her dogged determination. Or maybe it was the fact that she clearly had a heart, meaning she was somebody you might be able to trust. I tend to think that that is what made her the anchor for this whole group that Maine would form. This is a backstory that I didn't know I needed because it suits Dorio very, very well. I would have loved to have added this as a section to my analysis on Dorio because I believe that it does add a lot to the idea that she is a good person. I think that this ability to be reasonably compassionate towards others is what made her the glue that held Maine's crew together. Even after Maine's death, I still sort of feel like if Dorio was still alive, things could have been super different in the ending of Edge Runners. I also love that when you see her being very supportive and positive and just enjoying herself when she's training David, you can kind of see why, because to her, strength training and exercise isn't about getting gains or being stronger. This is a bonding activity that she did with the two people she loved the most in her earliest years. I think it's a reminder for her of better times. But I will say, her growing up carrying that pressure of her parents' dreams being impressed upon her is something that is not unlike David or Lucy. Most characters on this show are struggling to balance what others want for them and what they want for themselves. I can't help but wonder if Dorio ever truly realized what she wanted out of life, or if Maine's crew was just a way to stop asking herself the harder questions of trying to figure out who she wanted to be. It makes me think of the stereotype of the very dedicated mom who shoves her own requirements and needs and desires in order to care for her kids or her family. I just hope that Dorio found happiness and purpose and fulfillment in the life that she led. Because that's all we have. <laughs> The next character on this list is someone that I have never analyzed, and that is because there has been next to nothing on him, and he doesn't really appear all that much in the grand runtime of Edge Runners. Falco was actually a farm kid from Texas, and he loved ripping around the fields on his tractor. This was a road that led him to the racetrack, where he became a highly decorated and celebrated racer. Few people had his level of control and expertise. Falco was winning all the time, and he became something of a minor celebrity. But Falco was actually getting bored of winning. He didn't race for wealth or for fame. Falco did it because he enjoyed it, and he enjoyed the challenge of it. This desire for challenge is what led him to Night City, where he took part in street races in this wonky urban setting, so different from what he was used to. This was the first time in a long time that Falco actually was challenged by other racers, and he actually lost a lot of races. But to Falco, this was not a negative thing. This was what would push him to be better, and he enjoyed that a lot. Eventually, Falco had built such a reputation, even in the afterlife, that he was being employed from time to time by mercenary gangs as their driver. Falco actually found he preferred the adrenaline and the payments that he would get from these kinds of jobs. And so he became a full-time driver for Edge Runner Crews, hence being how he met Maine. It's a small story, but it is very cute. I think it's really sweet that he was a farm boy who grew up to achieve big city dreams sort of deal with his racing. Falco was cool, and it's just nice to now know a little bit more about that one other survivor from the show. I've had people request that I make a video on Falco. Like, I think that's the closest thing I will ever do to an analysis on Falco. Always remind myself that if I am going to cover a character, there needs to be at least an even amount of speculation with facts. I definitely feel like with Falco, there's far too much speculation versus facts to actually make a substantial interesting video, so ah, probably not, but it was still fun to see. This backstory is my favorite because it genuinely, I think, can change how a lot of people view this character. Kiwi's story is tragic and horrible, and I wish I was surprised by it, but I am not. In the video I made on Kiwi, I had a strong feeling that she had undergone some degree of abuse. I didn't know what, and I'm very sad to find out the truth of it. 
However, this backstory is just, it's the most hard-hitting. Kiwi was sold to a corporate factory when she was basically a toddler. She doesn't remember her parents at all. Her small size gave her an advantage amongst all the machinery in the cramped confines of this factory prison that she basically lived and worked in. The factory foreman took a liking to her and made sure she was protected and provided for. And as she got older, this affinity for her led to promotions and better pay and more comfort for her. However, as things tend to go in cyberpunk, this was not out of the goodness of his heart. The foreman had basically been grooming her because once she reached a quote unquote appropriate age, that's what it says, he propositioned her and posed it as payment for the good that he had done for her. Kiwi said no and he sold her to a brothel basically to live a life as a sex slave for as long as she was worth something. Kiwi was skilled enough from her time in the factory that she was able to jury rig a sort of doll chip. This bit of tech would not erase her memories after each client. However, it would blur her senses and mute her emotional responses just to help her get through the days a little easier. After two years of enduring this, Kiwi's jaw was ripped off by a client with gorilla arms. But instead of getting her face restored, Kiwi sort of saw this as her first little bit of freedom. Because while Kiwi was recovering, she decided that she was done being used and abused. Donning the mask that she now wears, Kiwi learned to be a netrunner all her own. She was a quick learner, and she educated herself more and more whenever she had a spare moment. Kiwi's skills with netrunning and her gumption escalated to the point that she eventually caused some sort of mechanical accident that led to the burning down of her old factory and the brothel, with her pimp and the old foreman still inside. Kiwi left for Night City, for the first time in her life, sort of free. It was Becca who actually introduced Kiwi to Maine's crew, which allowed Kiwi to more or less work for herself, but in a way, Night City was a prison all its own. It's very sad to know that Kiwi had to endure this kind of pain, not to compare pain types or anything, it's just, yeah. The fact that Kiwi's mask got punched off by Maine again has a lot more impact knowing what that means to her. I can't help but also wonder if that's why Falco was as mad as he was with Maine. Of course, he could just be mad that Maine's being a douche, but there's a whole other level if Kiwi had confided to Falco about this part of her past, and they do seem to be closer than some of the other edge runners. It's just a horrible thing. It's it's a horrible visual. It was always very like, ugh, but now it's even worse. It makes total sense that Kiwi is the one to tell Lucy that she should trust nobody. The one person who Kiwi thought she could trust growing up ended up being somebody who tried to use and abuse her, who groomed her, posing goodwill as something that needed to be repaid. Kiwi's been used her whole life by other people. How she feels and what she wants has never been held in high regard. It's never even really on the radar of anybody. Faraday's the only person who outright tries to kind of use that to manipulate her, promising her what she might want to get her to work with him, even though it's empty. I think the emptiness that she felt started with Maine punching her mask off and just got worse as David took over as leader. I think Dorio was the only other person in the crew that really showed any care to Kiwi, and with her death, it wasn't the same. Becca would mock her, David would sort of just expect her to do things, and we can see that this does kind of bother Kiwi with the remarks she makes in the car with Falco. Ultimately, I think Kiwi did end up telling the Edge Runners crew where Faraday was headed and shared Lucy's coordinates because she realized that Lucy was going to suffer the exact same fate that she did. Somebody who she had once viewed as a protege. Kiwi allowed her fears and her past traumas to rule her in the present, to the point that they destroyed her, and she recognized that when it was too late to go back. 
I also think that's why she went back to Faraday, who is very obviously a toxic person who is not trustworthy. And I think it goes beyond just money, I feel like it could even just be trauma and conditioning. Kiwi is a fascinating kind of Judas. Her past doesn't make her actions right, but it makes them a lot more understandable. More and more as I rewatch this show and now knowing this backstory for sure, Kiwi has become my favorite character in Edge Runners just due to her complexity. I am very glad we got to know more about her. It's just tragic that this is what it was for her. Last but not least, we have Becca and Pilar. And I will say that Pilar is the one character on this list that I think I would make the most changes in my earlier video on him for. This brother and sister duo are the children of a Night City veteran, somebody called Papa Sunrise. He raised both his son and daughter with tales of his exploits as an edge runner. Pilar in particular took these stories to heart and wanted to be just like his dad, and his dad did train him to be an edge runner. It wasn't easy training, but it did make Pilar into somebody who is capable of surviving. This came in particularly useful, especially after his father's strange disappearance. Pilar was now left to fend for himself and his little sister. They actually lived out the back of a car on the streets. Pilar did most of this on his own, aside from the occasional help from old family friends like Wakako Okada, who Pilar often referred to as Auntie. But even then, life was still rough. Becca herself was an extremely rowdy and bombastic and dangerously caring person, often to the wrong kind of people. Becca was the type to take pity on someone who she was hired to kill, allowing them to move in with her as a roommate because they needed help. She would miss an important meeting with a fixer to pet a puppy. She would defend the vulnerable that she encountered, even if the odds were against her. Because for her, her courage, as well as the amount of ammo she had, was enough. For Pilar, this was an added stress because this meant that keeping his sister safe and alive was a lot more difficult. Becca was difficult to keep track of and also to keep out of harm's way. Pilar is definitely gross and my opinion of him has not changed in that regard, but he did take protecting his little sister seriously from everyone except himself. Joining Maine's crew was a way to rein Becca in and to ensure that the jobs they did were successful because in the days where Pilar and Becca were forced to work together in order to make enough money to survive, many of those jobs would implode because of Becca's way of doing things very suddenly, very passionately, and very explosively. Having Maine to lead and the other runners to help manage Becca's chaos was something of a relief for Pilar in more ways than one. Becca and Pilar have a very amusingly aggressive sibling relationship that I am reviewing in my head a little more differently than before. If I could go back and redo both my videos on these two, I think I would speak of the relationship as a little more loving and caring. Just messed up. And this backstory makes Pilar's immaturity and impulsivity so much more understandable. Being forced as a child to raise another child, he didn't really have that space and support to really decide who he wanted to be as an adult. He didn't really have that chance. This backstory definitely paints a more sympathetic picture of Pilar. And I do feel for him a lot more here. His past traumas really play into how hedonistic he is, and also how gross he is. He doesn't seem to have any impulse control, and it makes a lot more sense now why. Of course, Pilar indulges in what he has now. Not that him having a rough childhood is an excuse for him being an ass. My mom had a horrible childhood, and she has done everything in her power to be the person that her parents weren't. Total side note, I am very grateful to have had that modeled for me from a young age that there are no excuses for being a douche. None. But it is important to acknowledge that Pilar was a screwed up kid and so was Becca. He lived a tragic life where he wasn't really able to live for himself until he was older. But by then the damage was done. And then he died just as tragically scarring Becca for life. The one person that I think he felt responsible for protecting. Becca herself's backstory isn't surprising, but it's very fitting. 
Hers might not be a super detailed story with a lot of huge events, but the fact that she was as sheltered as one can be when living on the streets does explain why Becca is so self-destructively compassionate and willing to give so much of herself even though it inevitably destroys her. This backstory actually makes me even more annoyed at David for him sort of taking advantage of this trait of Becca's in order to help manage his own mistakes. Because I now can't help but think of how Pilar and Becca's father, as it says in the backstory, used to scold and try to dissuade Becca from being as ridiculously caring and compassionate as she was. But I can't help but think that Pilar was on a level, concerned that this would be what hurt his little sister the most in the end. It's like both Pilar and their father knew on a shared, differing level that Becca's kindness could easily be turned into a weakness by the wrong person who would want to take advantage of it. And to me, David is that person. It breaks my heart. It hurts! <laughs> I also question if the edge runner life is something that Becca would have wanted. Even Pilar, after getting to an age where he could properly decide that for himself. These two were forced into this life by circumstances beyond their control, and it's very, very unfortunate. And that is that for all of the Edge Runners Mission Pack character backstories. That was a mouthful. Except for Adam Smasher. Adam Smasher does have a bio in this, but I am not going to cover it because I am still gathering footage to do a full video on this guy. It was a very nice surprise to get all these stories about these characters because never did I ever expect I'd be able to cross-reference my analyses with this kind of thing. The other thing too that I want to say about these backstories is that they just prove how well written these characters are. Because I think that for a lot of these characters, I think it's natural to feel an assumption as to some of what we've discovered here today, as they are on the show, long before these little bios came out. It feels so real when you can see in a character's behavior or their words, their actions, their facial expressions, the things that they do echoing back to the stories that they lived as kids or as young adults or big events that shaped them. And every single one of these backstories fits each character so well, it was a joy to look into all of them. It just enriches the world. It was very, very fun. Thank you very, very, very much for watching, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Let me know if any of these character backstories have changed your opinions on any of these characters. I'm curious to see how many people change their mind on Kiwi. I'm currently working on some Phantom Liberty character videos, which will take some time because I'm still getting through the DLC and getting all the footage. So I will see you again in the next one, guys. Have a good one. Goodbye.